Hello and welcome to another episode of the Clinical Pharmacist podcast. I'm your host, Runa Saleem, and I am joined today by Rahina Kassam. Rahina, welcome. Hi, Rina. Hi, yeah. Thanks for having me. Right, it's a pleasure. So really excited about today's topic. Today we are talking about whether primary care is for you as a pharmacist. So we know a lot of pharmacists are keen to transition into the primary care sector. We know it's because it's a very rewarding role, rightly so, but we know it can be quite challenging compared to some of the other sectors, perhaps. So we thought it would be a good idea for Rahina and myself to come on here. I think we've got both of us have got a lot to say on this topic because we are heavily involved in the recruitment, deployment, interviews of pharmacists, and we see which pharmacists do really well and which pharmacists, unfortunately, may struggle more than others. So let's just start off with Rahina, just introduce yourself again to our audience and remind them of your role and what your main responsibilities are. Hi, everyone. So as Runa said, my name's Rahina. So I am one of the service managers at Clinical Pharmacist Solutions. So one of my main roles as part of my day-to-day activities is heavily involved in employ deploy of pharmacists. So I work a lot with a lot of our surgeries and I am interviewing pharmacists on a day-to-day basis to try and get them in a position where they're ready to work in general practice. So a lot of my pharmacists will come from different sectors, whether it be community, whether it be hospital, or even we'll, we'll get people that have already worked in general practice that like the work from home life style and want to start working with us or they quite like the company ethos. So it's quite nice to see different backgrounds of pharmacists coming through to us. So I'm very involved with the interview process and picking the right candidates for the roles. Thank you. Yeah. So it's clear that I think you will have a lot of insight to share based on your observation of the last couple of years. So, and if I can just introduce myself as well, I am the Academy Director, but I also am involved in part of the recruitment process and some of the inductions and also the supervision of pharmacists. So I can really see which pharmacists are doing very well, uh, which pharmacists need a bit more support. And sadly, on some occasions, we do have some pharmacists who realize that it's just too much of a challenge for them and they do um, pull out, although it is rare, uh, but it has happened. Also, when it comes to interviewing pharmacists, it's not only the pharmacists that are um, inexperienced, but some experienced pharmacists as well. So it varies. Of course, the pharmacists who are experienced, they naturally will tend to do a lot better. But it works, I think, for both experienced and inexperienced pharmacists. Hopefully, you know, regardless of your experience, you should be able to benefit from today's session. So I think to start with, Rahina, maybe if we could talk about which pharmacists interview well. So when you are interviewing a pharmacist, what sort of qualities are you looking for? So generally, when when I'm interviewing pharmacists, in the first 30 seconds, what comes through to me is how they are as a person, how confident they are, like, are they well-spoken? Have they prepared for this interview? So we use Zoom quite a lot to do interviews. Have they come into the interview with their camera on, ready to participate in the interview? And that really stands out. Another thing that really comes across is if someone's actually done their homework. So looking at system one, looking at EMIS, knowing a little bit of of background about the day-to-day role of a clinical pharmacist. So these things really stand out to me when I'm speaking to a pharmacist for the first time. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting that all the points that you mentioned, they weren't, you didn't really touch upon the clinical aspect, which shows that it's character that we look for, especially when you're employing someone into your organization. We know that, you know, organizations are made of people. So first and foremost, we need to make sure that the person has the right personality um, and, you know, sort of morals and uh, personality that will be a great fit for the organization. So it's not just the clinical aspect when you're applying for a role in primary care. And I think with, with any role as well, it's also all those other things that you've mentioned as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think as an academy ourselves, so we focus on the clinical side as well. So we can help to build those clinical skills. We can advise. As pharmacists, we all know where our resources are. And As part of the journey of becoming a primary care pharmacist, it is a steep clinical learning curve. So that can be built. But I think as your character develops as well, and as you show yourself in that interview for the first time, they're the main qualities that we like to see because 
as we say, clinical, we can build on. Yeah, definitely. So say, for example, a pharmacist applies and they're worried that they may not have enough clinical knowledge for the role. A majority of the time, pharmacists without an experience are going to lack in some way um, when it comes to the clinical aspect. And as you say, it's something that can be built upon. If you have the right attitude and you're willing to learn, you identify that you have those learning needs and you're willing to put the, the time and effort in to build upon those. I think that that's a great starting point. And we have taken a lot of pharmacists, haven't we, with absolutely no primary care experience at all. And I think three months into the role, they're a completely different pharmacist and they have done really well because of that great attitude that um, they've shown right from the start. No, absolutely. And I think we probably had the same examples across the way where a pharmacist has come in completely new to the sector and three to six months in, they've completely flourished in their role. They're doing complex kind of reviews. They're doing MHRA alerts across the whole surgery and the feedback that we just get about them is absolutely amazing just in a short period of time. Yeah, no, definitely. So we've spoken about the characteristics of a pharmacist. Can you tell us a little bit more about which candidates do you think would do well in a role like this? So I think candidates that are generally proactive. So Mm -hmm. if you know that you're coming into the role, have you had a look at what information you've got on the systems? Have you had a look at once you know exactly what surgery you're going to be in? Have you had a look at the local and national guidelines for that particular surgery? Like just doing your research and finding out about the practice, just that proactiveness will take you a a very, very long way. And just resourcefulness as well. So have you had a look at your BNF? Have you had a look at your nice CKS? Do you know where to find the information that you might not necessarily know off the top of your head, where you can start to look for that evidence base that you're going to use within your practice every single day? How about yourself, Runa? What what yeah. sorts of qualities? I've got an interesting one, actually. I would say that uh, from experience, the pharmacists that I've seen that have done really well Um, are those who are very fast readers. And the reason why this is the case is because in this role, you are doing a lot of reading. So a lot of it's information gathering, whether it's within the patient record itself, or whether it's, you know, using any resources. If you're a fast reader, and you can pick out that information very quickly, you can make your clinical decision faster. And on the other hand, we have seen some pharmacists who are naturally not very fast readers, and they tend to be slower than average, we find that they do take a lot longer to complete their work. And it just adds that additional time pressure. So I think, yeah, if you're a fast reader, then, you know, you've already got an advantage. I would say another one is someone who is not afraid of making clinical decisions. So we know that in this role, it's all about making clinical decisions, whether it's do we issue this prescription or not? Do we up titrate? Do we down titrate? When you receive a clinic letter, do we add this or do we not? A lot of it is just gathering all the information and making a clinical decision. And I think if you're afraid of taking that responsibility after you've gathered the information to make a clinical decision, it's going to be really difficult because if you can't make the clinical decision and you want to pass the buck to someone else, then you know, it's not very useful for the practice. Absolutely. And I think just building on that as well. So we're there to alleviate GP pressures. So we don't want to constantly be sending sending tasks back to the GP. Of course, there's going to be times where we need to have GP input in terms of prescribing and getting advice, but we are the experts on medication as well. So to be able to make that clinical decision goes such a long way. So I think confidence in your abilities as a pharmacist is a really big thing. Yeah, definitely. Because as soon as you enter the practice, you are seen as the expert in in medicine. Um, And uh, fair enough, if you are brand new to the role, you may not be expected to start running your clinics uh, straight away, whether it be hypertension, asthma or diabetes. But you would definitely be expected to carry out basic tasks such as processing medication requests or um, interpreting clinic letters and actioning the letters from the prescriber on there. So yeah, so I think building from that as well is you should also be able to have really good interpretation skills. So as you said, being really resourceful and using all the guidelines that are available to us, you also need to be able to not only know where they are, but be able to interpret that information to um, aid you in your clinical decision making. 
No, absolutely. And I think it's not a trick question. You don't have to be scared to use your resources. Like you've got your BNF, you've got your SPS, you've got your SPCs, like don't be afraid to use your resources. And I feel like some pharmacists may feel that they need to know all of it off the top of their head. It's great to build that knowledge and it comes with time, but you can always refer to these reference sources. Yeah, absolutely. And if you are in doubt, hopefully you've got a good team behind you and you will be hopefully able to bounce back some clinical queries and just get a second opinion on something. And we do know that, you know, the confidence will come with experience and also confidence also comes with how much knowledge you have. So I think it's important to understand that you need to put a lot of effort in yourself outside of your work time to read nice guidelines. I think to be honest, as a pharmacist, although we may necessarily not use a lot of the clinical knowledge in a sector like community pharmacy, we are expected to have that knowledge because I think when you go back and read primary resources such as NICE guidelines, you will find that actually we were taught a lot of this at university level. So it shouldn't be brand new. I think sometimes community pharmacists, we may use that as an excuse sometimes, but I don't think it should be used as an excuse altogether. No, absolutely. So going on the complete other side, Runa, mm-hmm. what type of pharmacist do you think doesn't do well in GP practice? Okay, so I've already touched upon a couple. So someone who's a very slow reader, I think they're just going to really struggle for time and they'll be overloaded with work and it's going to be really stressful for them. Another one is probably someone who's not great with IT. I think you don't have to be an IT expert, but coming into primary care, there are different GP softwares to use. System One and Emis being um, one of the two main softwares. So I think if you really struggle, I think that's just going to be another challenge for you to overcome as well as the clinical aspect. Another one is, I think, lack of attention to detail, which I think as pharmacists, we are trained to have that attention to detail. In the community pharmacy, is something that we need anyway with our accuracy checking, but it's even more so important when you've got you know, so much information to process, such as when you're reading a clinic letter, you know, just missing out a couple of words can really change the course of your clinical decision making. So those are the couple of things that I can think of right now. What about you? Yeah, so absolutely. I completely agree with what you've just said there. I think the only additional one that I might add is timekeeping. So I think timekeeping and consultation skills, actually. So I think a lot of the time we find that we'll, we'll end up on a long medication review or an SMR. And it's just about directing the flow of that consultation and being able to really extract that information that you do need from that patient just to make sure that they are taking the medication safely. I know we can always get stuck in a consultation where someone might not be happy with the surgery or they've got this complaint and that complaint and it might end up taking up about 15 to 20 minutes of your consultation. It's just about wrapping that up with the patient, making them feel heard, making them understand you're there for that, but actually bringing the consultation back to your medication review and seeing how you can best care for that patient. So I think timekeeping goes hand in hand with that, because if you end up having half an hour SMR slot and it's your first day and you don't know how to wrap that conversation up and you're now running an hour and a half late for your clinic, I think It's just about building that and building the confidence to be able to have that consultation and know how to direct the flow of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we know that we we want to spend time with our patients, but I think Mm. we've all been there where some of the patients, you know, they love to chat, don't they? Um, And you have to sort of steer, as you said, uh, the consultation back in the right direction to make sure that you are completing the consultation for what it was booked for. I think as so with regards to great communication and people skills, they are very important, but not only with you as a, as a clinician and patient um, sort of complex, but also I think with the rest of the practice team as well. If you've got a great relationship with the receptionist staff, for example, the regular GPs there, I think that goes a long way. And Perhaps it's it's probably one of the key things, perhaps maybe receiving great feedback about a pharmacist. What's your experience with that, Rahina? So I feel that a lot of our pharmacists, actually, we actually get quite a nice bit of feedback from the practices with regards to them. Because like I said, from the first day, we get most of them to just send that introductory email to say, hi, my name is... Rahina, I'm joining your practice today. If you need to reach out to me, this is my email address. Please feel free to drop me a screen message. And I feel like 
that can really change the relationship right from the get-go rather than just kind of dropping in doing your clinics turning your laptops off and like going home at the end of the day so I think that's where we've had the most benefit and we've had the most positive feedback it's where you've got a really good relationship with your surgeries yeah definitely Speaking from personal experience as well, I know when I've got a great relationship with the receptionist staff, I think sometimes pharmacists underestimate, you know, yeah. the influence that reception team can have, but a lot of the communication is through the reception team. So I think it's really important to ensure that, if, as, they, as you said, they know who you are, build that really good rapport with them, and they're not going to forget you. They're going to remember you when they when they need something, and, and they are going to feed that back to the rest of the practice team. So yeah, I agree with all those points. Okay, so I think we've discussed a fair few points, Rahina, and hopefully um, the audience can take away some of that information and apply it in practice, whether they're already in practice or whether they're interested in transitioning into the primary care sector. Any closing comments, Rahina? Yeah, so I think that whether you are working in primary care at the moment, whether you're thinking of working in primary care, there's so many resources that are available to you. So number one, we do have our clinical pharmacist network group on Telegram. So if you are already working and you've got queries throughout your day, you just need some peer support, then please feel free to join that and just drop questions in throughout the day. It's always manned by lots of pharmacists. Additionally, we're always taking feedback from our pharmacists during inductions. It's what they find difficult or where they've struggled it's helped us to develop kind of our training materials that we then go on to give to our pharmacists that are working with us to help them develop so things like going straight into a clinical medication review it's led us to develop our CMR training products so if you are looking to go into primary care there's so many resources out there for you and you can access these all via cpaweb.org Thank you, Rahina. And I think just to touch upon that as well, you know, as you said, we develop a lot of our training programs based on the needs of pharmacists in practice. And we develop the, the, the training programs are developed by experienced pharmacists and GPs who are in practice. So hopefully you will find that any training program that you look into on CPA, you'll find it is applicable to your work and any course that you complete, it will enable you to actually carry out a new clinical service in practice. We also have some free resources on there as well. So some of the internal SOPs that we use for our pharmacists, we, we've actually released to the public as well. One of them being uh, a medication review um, SOP. There's also a template cover letter. There's also interview tips and guidance. And recently we've also launched an SOP for how to deal with acute prescription requests. So hopefully you guys all have a look at that and hopefully it benefits you in practice. We'd love to hear your feedback. And so feel free to get in touch and share any of your comments or experiences. And thanks again for tuning in. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.